Well, thanks very much for having me. It's really good to be here. And um, one of the things I was reminded of when I was in East Africa um, was it's really good to hang around with people who are trying to make a difference. Um, a lot of people ask me when I went to report on such an awful um, event like this, uh, this, this, this tragic famine, they, they ask me about, you know, how did you sort of cope with it? How did you survive? How, how, didn't it really affect you in a way that was so hard to deal with? And I answer them by saying, well, there's two things about the experience that I, that I really cherished. And one was that I was with people who were trying to do something about it, and that actually does make a big difference. And the other thing I guess I felt was that it was uh, one of those stories that was so worthwhile to do. It, um, I, just a f I was just in um, Kenya a few weeks ago. Uh, I was there in Dadaab refugee camp. I'll just put it. That's actually an aerial view of the outskirts of Dadaab. I got the opportunity to go there and report on what was going on. And as I said, I, I, I felt that it was one of those stories that was just so important to cover. It was difficult. It was an awful uh, experience in some ways, but it had the, um, I guess, a real importance about it. I've travelled to Nairobi and then we went up to the camp at Dadaab, which is right on the border of Kenya and Somalia. Uh, here's, here's a typical scene from the, uh, from the camp. There's normally a lot more people around than that, but I, and I have a great debt of gratitude to Jackie Goshen, the uh, photographer who came with me, one of Australia's best press photographers, and she's the one who took all these wonderful photographs. I wanted to just tell you a few stories about what I experienced. Dadaab, there's a typical scene from the camp that is uh, a family who have recently arrived just building their hut. You can see that um, they've been given a tarpaulin by the UNHCR and uh, they're doing their best to put together their, a place to live. You can see that some of the people, like in this case, haven't even got a tarpaulin yet. I met lots of people who couldn't even get any plastic to put over there their homes, uh, and so they're just building it out of sticks and leaves, basically. Anyway, uh, along the way, I found um, a whole lot of very powerful stories, or I encountered a whole lot of people with very um, gut-wrenching and powerful stories. This woman's called Ladan, and I met her almost 10 minutes after arriving in Dadaab. Literally, it was the first stop we'd made. We stopped, I think one of the photographers wanted to take a photograph nearby. I got out of the car and a big crowd of people, um, well, actually it just seems to be, how, do you know how I stop it from moving on? Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Um, a big crowd of people kind of straight away came up and one of them happened to be the sort of the block leader, a community leader in that area. And I said to him, you know, what's happened in your block today? He said, oh, we've, we've buried two children to this morning. One of them was that woman's daughter, an eight-year-old girl who had endured the long journey walking all the way from Somalia to the refugee camp. And that morning she died. She, she actually had an illness that she had already and the whole experience was just too much for her. They'd only been in the camp for a few weeks. She'd been sick the whole time and, and didn't recover. As I got talking to Ladan, I asked about her other children. She had five other children. And she went into the tent. And this is basically the scene when she came out. You can see there her two-year-old, who uh, was also um, with her, was very sick. And you just have to look at her. Even in this photograph, you can see what a, what a poor state of health she was in. So in, in one day, she'd lost a child. And then I found her with this two-year-old who was very ill. Now, oh, it, was, it was very fortunate. I was with an aid worker from Save the Children and we contacted someone from the local hospital and the good news is that an ambulance came and took this um, little, little kid called Salan and her mother to the hospital. You can see there behind the, another one of her children uh, who's about, I think, two or three years old. Uh, I guess it showed me that at the Dab, um, you, it was very... You, it was very um, Death was a common encounter going there, but at the same time, heartbreak and hope, if you like, could both happen on the same day. Because I, I, I ended up visiting the hospital where they'd been taken a day later, and the woman just looked 
a different person. Sure enough, she'd lost her daughter, but at least this other child of hers, who was on the way to death, had been saved. Now, it's very interesting, you know, a child like that, who is just so sick and so malnourished, uh, severely malnourished, and basically without intervention on the way to dying, a week la- if they get to hospital and they get treatment, within a week, they are discharged with proper um, sort of, you know, nutritious um, food or treatment that is appropriate. It was amazing to me that such a simple treatment in many ways is all that's required, even though their situation is so dire. Here's a close-up of that child, who, as I said, is now, I hope, much better. But as I said, the sad reality is that right near the house, that's the makeshift graveyard where that woman's daughter has been buried. This is another woman who I met the following day, actually. Her name is Halima, and you can see there her son, Muhammad. I found them sitting in the dirt at the reception centre, as they call it, which is the place where a refugee who might have just arrived at the camp can go. They get registered as a, as a, as a refugee, and they get some rations and provisions, and they're able to then go and establish themselves in the camp. Again, this, this fellow is quite lucky because as part of that registration process, they get a medical check and a medical treatment. You can see here one of the medical um, professionals checking out that child. I could tell from the moment I saw him that he was malnourished. If you look at his hair, you can see how it's discoloured and a bit reddish. That's a clear sign of malnutrition. And... Uh, Again, one of the, um, the telltale signs, and I'm afraid everywhere you look in the dub, you see children with discoloured hair. The thing that struck me about this story, again, another very powerful story of human survival, she'd carried her one-year-old for 23 days to get to the camp from, from her home in Somalia, and she'd left two bigger children there in, in Somalia with their father because she, she told me, I couldn't carry them all. Same thing, though, at least now. He's, he, he was admitted straight to hospital. This, this photograph appeared on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald, and I think also in The Age. Very, uh, a beautiful photograph uh, that conveys a lot of um, the anguish at the moment in that part of the world. And the good news, again, for him is because he got this medical intervention, he was taken straight to the hospital ward, and there you can see him getting weighed, and he will have the uh, emergency treatment required to bring him back to full health. Many are not so lucky. I met this woman um, <clears throat> very similar way to the first lady I told you about. I just asked a village, I was sort of a, a block leader, a community leader, what, it, what was going on. This was a few days later. And he took me to meet this lady who had also just lost a child. But the thing about this story that was really very confronting was another woman almost came up to me, um, almost while I was encountering this other woman. And you can see here that she was carrying a child who was, again, very, very sick. Um, this, this uh, again, a child who was um, definitely in need of emergency attention. This was a much more difficult case because he, she had eight children and they'd just arrived in Dadaab and... One of the, th- the issues there is a lot of the people are very poor, they're illiterate, they are not educated, and so they find it hard to understand about what it might be to go to a hospital or whatever. A, one woman said to me she'd never heard of medicine, um, such as their, I guess, lack of um, education. And so uh, this, this lady uh, was, was not convinced that it was going to make any difference to go to the hospital. So these are some of the issues that aid workers like Save the Children and other NGOs work, at work in the area are dealing with not just poverty and, and, and hunger but also a lack of understanding and awareness of what, what needs to be done to help these children who are in such need. Here's another child I encountered. Th- these photos are of another amazing experience that I, that I had while I was in Dadaab. This is a family on the move. They're, they're, they're near the end of their journey um, you can see a big party. There was actually six families as part of this group. And again, they'd been walking for weeks from their home in Somalia. I actually happened to find them when 
they had just, they were actually on a road not far from the camp, so their journey was nearly finished. And as they got near the camp, someone had given them a bag of rice, this group of families. There were six families, I reckon, about 40 children. Nearly every mother was carrying a baby. And they'd got this sack of rice. They'd just stopped right on the side of the road where they were. They'd got wood and they'd cooked the food because it's the first food that they'd had for three days. And you can see here the children scouring the wooden bowls. But what was even more amazing, though, was once the food was over, they, they, as well as, as I was just going to say, as well as having their rice, they, had, they were washing it down with this drink they called tea, but basically it was muddy water and sugar that they'd boiled on the kettle. Um, but it was a very welcome meal. I was r interested by the fact that there was about these 40 children. I was just thinking about what it would be like in Australia if you had a group of 40 children who hadn't eaten for three days. But as soon as they'd finished their meal, this photo shows they were up and on their way. You can see the little boy there carrying a blackened pot that they'd just cooked their tea in. Um, and they basically carried what they had on their head. They, I asked them if they had anything else, and they said, no, we lost all our cattle, our, our land is gone. This is all we have. They were carrying it. But as you can see, if you look closely at that photo, all the women are carrying a child as well as their goods and chattels. That's just a bit of a snapshot of some of the stories I encountered at Dadaab. It's a, it's a very harsh and difficult environment, a windswept place, a very, pretty hot and dusty. You can see here this woman has actually collected her water and she's rolling the water um, canister along the ground because they're very heavy to carry. This is just one of the scenes in the, in the day in Dadaab. There's a lot of queuing. Um, Dadaab refugee camp now numbers over 400,000. It's the third biggest um, town in Kenya and it's the biggest refugee camp in the world. And uh, you can imagine the, the logistical task of feeding that many people who don't have anything. Um, it was quite an amazing scene to watch how, um, how difficult it is even to get food in that situation. So you've got the circumstance where people have had this very difficult journey to get to the camp. They've arrived and at least there's help to be, to be, to be had. But... Um, it's still not an easy task to survive even in a refugee camp. This is a typical scene of how people have just come and set up their humpies and it's these people on the very edge of the camp, the new arrivals, if you like, who are the, very, the most vulnerable. And um, I spent a lot of time in this part of the camp. I mean, it's a vast camp and you can just wander around the outskirts. And even in a few hours on one day that I was, was out in the camps, I found at least a dozen children I actually, that, that were mal severely malnourished. I gave the, I did the upper arm test. If you measure sort of the, 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 the upper arm of a child between the elbow and the shoulder, between the ages of one and five, um, it's a very reliable test for malnutrition and at least a dozen of the kids who I found, just a journalist wandering around on the outskirts of the camp, were in the severely malnourished category. Um, I did my best to try and get them help but again, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a place at the moment that is overwhelmed. About 10,000 people are arriving at Dadaab every week. And the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the situation, I'm afraid, in the region, not just in that camp, is apparently deteriorating. There is a lot... Of, I mean, I guess to, just to conclude, I was... Um, uh, I guess challenged by the experiences of what, seeing all these families. Uh, it's not an easy thing to watch or experience, but again, I really think that's great that you're here. Uh, it shows that you're at least interested, and I think that's a good place to be in, rather than apathetic or not interested at all. It's hard to know what to do. It's hard to know how to respond. But um, I think it's good that there are um, significant efforts being made to assist. I'm sure there could be more. I hope they will be more in future. I think it's good that our government has made a big commitment to um, responding to the needs in the Horn of Africa. And it's great that you've got a tie up with Save the Children. I was, um, of course, I was reporting on lots of things, but I actually stayed with the Save the Children compound. Most of the journalists who were in Dadaab were being hosted by one of the NGOs or other. And um, I was impressed by the work that Save, was, Save were doing. I mean, obviously, when in a camp like this, that children have many needs, not just for food, but for protection, 
There are many children who arrive unaccompanied, you know, orphans, uh, and SAVE is doing a great job along with the other NGOs in that camp to uh, respond to their needs.